Sahana Vavatu, Sahana Bhunaktu, Saha Vidyan Karava Vahai, Tejas Vidavati Tamas Duma Vitvisha Vahai, Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Om. <coughs> Om. Good. Very good. Welcome to our weekly class on the Bhagavad Gita. Last week we just began chapter 4, uh, Jnana Karma Sannyasa Yoga. I explained the name of the uh, chapter. We'll continue with chapter 4 today. We'll begin, as always, with some recitation. Um, we'll begin with verse 6. As always, uh, as I'm chanting, read the translation and then repeat after me. A jopi son of Yayatma, a jopi son of Yayatma, Bhutanami Shwaropi son, Bhutanami Shwaropi son, Prakritam Swamadishtaya. Prakriti Swamadishtaya Sambhavam Yatma Mayaya Sambhavam Yatma Mayaya Yada Yada Hidharmasya Yada Yada Hidharmasya Glanir Bhavati Bharata Glanir Bhavati Bharata Abhutana Madharmasya Abhutana Madharmasya Taratmanam Srijamyaham Taratmanam Srijamyaham Paritranaya Sadhunam Paritranaya Sadhunam Vinashaya Chadushkritam Vinashaya Chadushkritam Dharma Samsthapanartaya Dharma Samsthapanartaya Sambhavami Yuge Yuge Sambhavami Yuge Yuge Janma Karma Chame Divyam Janma Karma Chame Divyam Evam Yo Veti Tatvataha Evam Yo Veti Tatvataha Tyaktva Deham Punar Janma Tyaktva Deham Punar Janma Naiti Mameti Sorjuna Naiti Mameti Sorjuna Vita Raga Bhaya Krodha Vita Raga Bhaya Krodha Man Maya Mamu Pashrataha Man Maya Mamu Pashrataha Bahavo Gnana Tapasa Bahavo Gnana Tapasa Puta Mud Bhava Magataha Puta Mud Bhava Magataha Ye Yatha Mam Prapadyante Ye Yatha Mam Prapadyante Tans the Taiva Bhajam Yaham Tans the Taiva Bhajam Yaham Mama Vart Manu Vartante Mama Vart Manu Vartante Manusha Parta Sarva Shaha Manusha Parta Sarva Shaha Kang Shanta Karmanam Siddhim Kang Shanta Karmanam Siddhim Yajanta Hiha Devataha Yajanta Hiha Devataha Chipram hi manu she loke, Chipram hi manu she loke, Sidhir bhavati karma ja, Sidhir bhavati karma ja. We'll pause here and return to where we left off. We had just seen these series of verses describing Sri Krishna as an avatara as an incarnation of Lord Vishnu, as a form of Ishvara, 
who projected himself into the world in a very special and powerful form. And we had some lengthy discussion in our prior class on avatara vada. The vada, the teaching about avatars, about these special incarnations of God. In response to that, there was a very good question here, uh, a comment uh, question, which was the, in Vedanta, we generally require the verification of whatever is taught in scripture. So you might remember, uh, we've discussed, I think, several times already, that all of Vedanta is based on Shruti, scripture, Yukti, reasoning, and Anubhava, personal experience. Which means anything taught in Shruti has to be supported by Yukti, reasoning, it has to be reasonable, will reject it if it's unreasonable. Also, it has to be supported by anubhava, personal experience. Everything in Vedanta has to meet this threefold criteria. It has to be scripturally based, it has to be reasonable, and it has to be in conformance with our experience. Everything in Vedanta is like that. If that's so, he asks, how can we, how can we uh, do that in relationship to these verses that we've just seen, referring to the avatara vada, uh, Sri Krishna incarnating himself into the world, also Sri Krishna remembering all of his prior births, even though we can't. How can we, it's revealed by scripture, Shruti, I think we can find plenty of reasoning, yukti, to support it. I gave that lucid dream metaphor in the prior class. But what about anubhava experience? There's no way in the world for us to experientially confirm Sri Krishna's appearance as an avatara in this world. So then it would appear to fail this threefold criteria for the teachings of Vedanta. But that's where the problem is. Really speaking, this avatara-vada is not part of the teachings of Vedanta. Remember, what we're studying here is a small section of the Mahabharata. And the Mahabharata includes many, many different kinds of teachings, one of which is Vedanta. We excerpt this Bhagavad Gita, these 18 chapters, we excerpt out of the Mahabharata and study them independently because there's so much wonderful Vedantic teachings in the Bhagavad Gita, in these 18 chapters. But because the Mahabharata from which it's drawn contains other subject matters in addition to Vedanta, the same is true for this excerpt, the Bhagavad Gita, it contains other subject matters in addition to Vedanta. Avatara Vada is not what Vedanta teaches. It's taught in the Mahabharata, it's taught in the Puranas quite extensively, it's taught in other scriptures. It is not part of the teachings of Advaita Vedanta. Why? The best way and, and perhaps simplest and most concise way of understanding what is Vedanta Vedanta is a set of teachings that basically helps you understand tat tvam asi. Tat, the reality of the universe. Tvam, you, asi, are. And there are so many teachings, of course, required to understand what is tat, that reality. What is tvam? Who are you, essentially? What is your true nature? And asi, how are these two possibly identical? All of the teachings of Vedanta are focused on making you recognize that. Turns out that the, the, uh, uh, this avatara vada, in fact, the entire doctrine of karma, really speaking, lies outside the teachings of Vedanta. Vedanta doesn't teach reincarnation. Vedanta doesn't teach the doctrine of karma. This all belongs to the larger, can we call it Hindu package, into which the teachings of Vedanta, in which the teachings of Vedanta are found. Um, that being so, we can admit, and we do admit readily, that the doctrine of karma is not a 
truth taught by Vedanta, it's a matter of belief. It's a matter of belief. And in particular now, this avatara that we've just discussed is not a Vedantic truth supported by Shruti, Yukti, and Anubhava. It is a doctrine. Vada means doctrine. Avatara vada. It is a doctrine. And this doctrine happens to be a matter of belief. Now that sets it aside as a different kind of subject matter because the teachings of Vedanta teach what is true. Beliefs are not true. In fact, if a belief were true, it wouldn't be a belief. <laughs> it would be a truth. The moment we call it a belief, we mean it can ni it's neither true nor false. The doctrine of karma is neither true nor false. Avataravara is neither, neither true nor false. These are beliefs and how we discern the value of beliefs. If beliefs are neither true nor false, neither right nor wrong, how do we evaluate a belief? A belief is either helpful or not so helpful or even harmful. There are some beliefs that are harmful to believe that someone who does not accept Allah as the one and only God, to say that that person is a kafir who should be killed, if, if that in fact is what is taught in Islam, and that's debatable, but if, if that is so, that belief is harmful. There are many harmful beliefs. Turns out that this doctrine of karma, doctrine of reincarnation, and this avataravada, they are beliefs and they are helpful beliefs. They're neither true nor false, but they're exceedingly helpful. Okay, enough said. In fact, we're going to see uh, coming up here, not in this verse, but in the next verse, we'll see some pure Vedantic teachings are, are coming here. So let us return and pick up the thread. This next series of verses, in fact, deals with Vedantic knowledge, and in particular, knowledge of Ishvara, knowledge of that avatara, just as we can inquire into the truth of who you are, what is your essential nature? And as we discussed in chapter two, your essential nature is independent of the body, independent of the mind and senses. Your fundamental essential nature as Atma is pure consciousness, Satchirananda. Just as we can inquire into the truth of you, the individual, we can inquire into the truth of Sri Krishna, of an avatara, and that's the next topic. So having introduced this avatara vada in the prior verses, now we take a turn away from that belief system, we take a turn towards profound Vedantic teachings, and we inquire what is the true nature of an avatara in general? What is the true nature of Ishvara, God? What is the true nature of Sri Krishna? We'll see that. Janma karma cha me divyam, janma karma cha me divyam, evam yo veti tattvataha, evam yo veti tattvataha, tyaktva deham punar janma, tyaktva deham punar janma, naiti ma meti sorjuna, Naiti ma meti sorjuna. Start in the second line. Evam, thus, yaha, one who, veti, one who knows. One who knows what? Go up to the top line. Me divyam janma, me, my, divyam, divine janma, birth, one who knows my divine birth, and also me divyam karma, my divine karma, as an avatara. So one who knows my divine birth and my divine deeds, but one who knows not as a matter of belief, 
one who knows, and here's the key word at the end of the second line, tattvataha, in reality, not as a matter of belief, one who knows the reality of Sri Krishna. And as I just suggested, just as we can inquire into the reality of you, we can inquire into the reality of Sri Krishna. And when we do so, and Sri Krishna is a form of Ishvara. By the way, I'm going to explain this briefly in this verse, and we'll see it in much more detail in the very next verse. We can say that just as the essence because of which you exist is Satchirananda Atma, in the same way, we can say the essence because of Ishvara, the god of the cosmos, exists. The essence because of which you exist, we call Atma. The existence because of which Ishvara exists, we call Brahman. Your essence is Atma. The essence of Ishvara is Brahman. And the Mahavakya Tattvamasi reveals the identity of those two, and that's what we'll see in the next verse. Hold on. <coughs> so here, Sri Krishna is speaking about one who knows Sri Krishna, not as an avatara, not as a matter of belief, but one who knows tattvataha in reality. That person, in a go moving on now to the third line, tyaktva deham, giving up one's body, meaning at the time of death, that person who has discovered the true nature of Sri Krishna, tattvataha, in reality, tyaktva deham, giving up the body at the time of death, punar janma, rebirth, na eti. Beginning of the fourth line, we have to separate those two words. Punar janma, rebirth, na eti. Eti means to go. Na eti, does not undergo rebirth. One who knows the truth of Sri Krishna does not undergo rebirth, but on the other hand, mam eti saha. Saha, that person, eti, reaches, goes to mam, that, per that person reaches me. O Arjuna, last word here, mam eti, that person reaches me. That person doesn't get reborn, that person reaches me, that person becomes enlightened. By discovering the reality because of which Ishvara exists, one becomes enlightened. And please, and what we're going to see in great detail in the next verse, the bigger picture is when you understand, when you discover the reality because of which Ishwara exists, you've understood the reality because of which everything exists, because of which the universe exists, because of which the stars and planets exist, the reality because of which you and me exist. So that's that key word, tattvataha, in reality. One who discovers this fundamental reality, this fundamental truth, that person becomes liberated, that person becomes enlightened, that person gains moksha, and gaining moksha, that person is not reborn. Now we'll see it in a little more detail. <coughs> Vitaragabhaya krodha, Vitaragabhaya krodha, Man maya mamu pashrataha, man maya mamu pashrataha, bahavo jnana tapasa, bahavo jnana tapasa, puta mud bhava magataha, puta mud bhava magataha. Very profound teachings in this verse. So Sri Krishna describes those who are vita without. Without what? Without raga, uh, desire, without bhaya, fear, and without krodha, anger. He could have used other words as well, 
those who are free from raga, bhaya, and krodha, those who are free from fear, desire, and anger, to be more specific and refer to our prior discussions, those who are free from raga and dvesha, those who are free from being compelled by their likes and dislikes, free from being compelled to chase after whatever they think is essential for their well-being, free from being compelled to run away from whatever they think is, is harmful to their well-being, free from those compulsions, compulsions of raga dvesha. Remember, we discussed at length in the prior chapter that raga dvesha is a primary impediment to spiritual growth. As long as you are compelled by raga dvesha, you're going to be so caught up in worldly activities, you're not going to make much progress in a life of spiritual growth. So step one in a life of spiritual growth, step one on the path to enlightenment, so to speak, is to break free from the compulsion of Raga Dvesha, and as we discussed in the prior chapter, the teachings of Karma Yoga are specifically intended to free you from that compulsivity of Raga Dvesha. So having become freed from Raga Dvesha, freed from that main impediment to, to spiritual growth and enlightenment, then what? Those people, uh, second line end, mam upashrataha, upashrataha, resorting to mam, me, Sri Krishna says, resorting to me, seeking me, seeking me, seeking the truth of me on that path of spiritual growth. So, so what does it mean to seek me, Sri Krishna, to seek Ishvara, as a prior verse said, to seek the reality because of what Sri Krishna exists. Tattvataha, the word came. So, Mamupasharataha, seeking me, seeking that absolute reality, that fundamental reality because of which Ishvara exists, because of the wor which the world exists because of which you and I exist, so seeking that reality. And those people then become, and here's a very important term, ma man maya. They become, man is a pronoun mat, me. Mat maya. They become, it literally means made of me, but that literal meaning doesn't have much sense. Made of me means they become non-separate from me. My translation here, absorbed in me. Not bad, but non-separate from me. They become me. They become non-separate from me. Now, how are we to understand that? The commentator, Madhusudana Saraswati, had some very important explanation for how it is that seeking the reality of Ishvara, you become non-separate from Ishvara. That's a paraphrase of, of the second line, according to Madhusudana Saraswati, the commentator. By seeking the reality of Ishvara, you become non-separate from Ishvara. How is that possible? Here we need some Vedanta, and I'll go to the board and show you how that is possible. Okay. So we begin with this understanding in Vedanta, understanding a fundamental relationship between form, I'm going to make sure I get this on the board, form and reality. So this relationship between form and substance, between form and reality, we've seen many times the example of the clay pot, where pot is the form and the reality is clay. A, a pot 
is merely a form, nama rupa, the terms we often use, whereas the clay out of which that pot is made is the underlying substance. It is a fundamental reality. And that's that word tattvataha in a prior verse is referring to this reality. So we can analyze anything in terms of form and underlying reality. So let's apply this analysis both to Ishvara, our word for God, which includes, of course, Sri Krishna, and we're also going to apply it to jiva. Jiva is a common word we use for individual conscious being. You're a jiva, I'm a jiva. So let's apply this analysis. So Ishvara has a form, Sri Krishna has a form, the form you know very well. You've seen so many pictures and perhaps some, some movies and TV serials on Sri Krishna. So Sri Krishna or Ishvara has a form and an underlying reality. Going beyond Sri Krishna just as that avatara, Ishvara has a form. Now Ishvara is the god of the universe. What kind of form? You and I are individual beings. We have individual forms. Shri, uh, Ishvara is a universal being which means Ishvara must have a universal form. A universal form, in fact, you've heard the term cosmic form. Universal form means cosmic form. So we'll say Ishvara has a cosmic form, and I'll explain that. Which means you and I have limited bodies. Ishvara has a limitless body, which means the physical body of Ishvara can be understood, this is a Vedantic perspective, so a belief-based perspective would present Ishvara as an avatara, as Lord Krishna, but a Vedantic perspective will present Ishvara as a one who has as a physical body the entire universe. The entire cosmos, all the planets and stars to the end of the universe and beyond, all of that material stuff is, so to speak, Ishvara's physical body. There are very beautiful verses, even in the Vedas, that describe Ishvara as the one who has the sun as his right eye, the moon as his left eye, the heavens as his belly, and the earth as his feet. And then one of many examples that poetically describe Ishvara as the one who has a cosmic form, the entire physical universe is his physical body, and the intelligence that pervades the universe is Ishvara's mind the intelligence that pervades the universe, the intelligence that holds the planets in orbit around the sun, the laws of nature, the laws, the intelligent, uh, Puja Swami Dayananda, love the expression, intelligent order. The intelligent order of the universe is a manifestation of Ishvara's intelligence. It's a manifestation of Ishvara's mind. So Ishvara has, is the one with a cosmic form, the one whose physical form is the entire universe, the one whose mind is the intelligence that pervades the universe. This is the form of, of notice this is a Vedantic perspective, the, the belief-based perspective is Ishvara has a form as Sri Krishna, as Lord Vishnu, as Lord Shiva, as God as Devi, or Saraswati in, in any form, Lakshmi. All of these forms are matters of belief based on scriptures like the Puranas. Here, we're getting a very Vedantic perspective, not a belief-based perspective, a knowledge-based perspective on who and what is Ishvara. And Ishvara is the one who has a, what kind of form? 
a cosmic form, a universal form. Well, what is the underlying reality now because of which that form exists? Just as a pot is a form that exists depending on clay, there must be an underlying reality because of which Yishura's cosmic form exists. And many of you know the name for that reality. I made mention to it before. We call it Brahman. And we describe Brahman as pure existence, pure knowledge, without limit. Satyam jnanam anantam. I don't want to burden you with too much Sanskrit here. Satyam, pure existence, jnanam, pure consciousness or knowledge, intelligence, and anantam, without limits, infinite. That underlying reality is Brahman. Brahman is the reality because of which Ishwara's cosmic form exists, and Brahman is the reality because of which the entire cosmos exists. That's a big topic. We won't go further into that right here. Let's, let's see this final relationship. Now, you and I, as jivas, we have individual forms. Individual forms means individual body. And within this individual body is a sukshma sharira, a subtle body consisting of prana, the life force, consisting of our powers of action, consisting of our sense powers, consisting of our mental faculties, manas and buddhi. All of these collectively create, uh, constitute your individual form. Now, just as a pot exists depending on its underlying reality, just as Ishwara's cosmic form exists depending on its underlying reality, in the same way you and I, as jivas, our individual forms exist depending on a fundamental reality. That's what we discussed at so much length in chapter two. We call that that fundamental reality, Atma, and we defined Atma as consciousness, con the consciousness that's present right now in this experience, the consciousness that reveals whatever's happening in your mind right now, reveals all your thoughts, emotions, sensations, that consciousness which on analysis, with understanding that consciousness with the help of the teachings of Vedanta, we come to understand the extraordinary nature of that consciousness. That consciousness being unborn, uncreated. That consciousness being unchanging and therefore utterly unaffected by any of the worldly problems. That consciousness being all pervasive, boundaryless, not stuck inside our bodies and minds, but pervading the cosmos. That is Atma. Now, <coughs> the commentator made this important association here. The topic, and, and just to show what he's, the point he makes, we want to f understand how is it that by knowing the essence of Ishvara, that's our topic, right? Knowledge of Ishvara. By knowing the essential nature of Ishvara, you become enlightened. Well, how is it that by knowing the essence of Ishura you become enlightened? You might be thinking, well, I thought it took self-knowledge, knowledge of the true self to be enlightened. Well, it turns out it's the same reality. And that's what the Mahavakya will just show here. No, I think I'm running out of room. I'll put it here. So that's why the Mahavakya says, Tat Tvam Asi, where Brahman is Tat, Atma is Tvam Asi. This is the meaning of the Mahavakya. This is the ultimate teaching of Advaita Vedanta. And that is Tat, Brahman, the reality because of which Ishvara's cosmic form exists, the reality because of which the cosmic 
the entire cosmos exists. That Brahman is the same as your essential nature, your nature as Atma, the, the inner self because of which you exist as an individual. And it stands to reason the reality because of which Ishvara exists, the reality because of which the cosmos exists, and the reality because of which you exist cannot be different realities. We're talking about a fundamental underlying reality. That fundamental underlying reality can but be one. So therefore, by understanding the reality of Brahman, tat, you are led to understand tat tvam asi. You're led finally to understand that the reality because of which Brahman exists I'm sorry, the reality because of which Ishwara exists and the reality because of which you and I exist are one and the same, that one fundamental reality, whether you call it Brahman, whether you call it Atma, it is one fundamental reality. And this is the revelation of the Mahavakya, Tat Tvam Asi. So now we've got those details here, and that's why the second line would be unintelligible, I think, without the help of this commentary. So he says, Mam, the commentator points out, Mam Upashrataha, by seeking the truth of Ishvara, by seeking the reality of Ishvara, Manmaya, they become non separate from Ishvara. By pursuing the reality of Ishvara, you become non-separate from Ishvara. How? And that's further described in the second half of this line. So these people who are, uh, just to get the big picture here, Vita, Raga, Bhaya, Kroda, those who are free from Raga, Dvesha, those who seek the reality of Ishvara, those who discover, Manmaya, those who discover that the reality because of which they exist is utterly non-different from the reality because of which Ishvara exists. They, now continuing to the third line, they are Bahavaha. That's encouraging. Many. Not just a few, but many of are they who become enlightened. And they, drop down to the last line, they, Putaha, they become purified. Now that's a cl tricky word because purification has many meanings in different contexts. So they become purified, and here's another key word going up a line, jnana tapasa. They become purified by the tapas of jnana, by the austerity of knowledge. The and, and tapas, take it as a spiritual practice, as a sadhana, by the practice, by the pursuit of knowledge. They become purified. Look at the significance here. They become purified. To become purified means to remove an impurity. And here we've got a very Vedantic perspective which points to the fundamental impurity or the fundamental problem that leads to suffering. To remember in our very introduction to all of this, we said that the fundamental problem which makes you suffer is failure to recognize your true nature. And we, we said very simply, the fundamental root cause for suffering is ignorance a fundamental kind of ignorance, an ignorance of reality. Let, let us say that. That ignorance of reality is the fundamental impurity. And how will you remove that impurity of knowledge? I'm sorry, that impurity of ignorance? Well, be, be careful here. Ignorance cannot be removed Ignorance, yeah, I don't want to make a big, we can go for a one hour excursion here. Let me not do so. Simply put, ignorance is removed by 
knowledge. That's simple. Ignorance is removed by knowledge. And ignorance of reality is removed by knowledge of reality. What is knowledge of reality? That's what we were <laughs> discussing. All of this shows that knowledge of reality. So those people, bahavaha, they are many, and they are putaha, they are purified, jnana tapasa, purified. The impurity of ignorance is removed by knowledge. In fact, tapas means heat, and it kind of implies a metaphor. The jnana tapas, we can metaphorically call the fire of knowledge. The fire of knowledge burns away the impurity of, of ignorance, and in this way, madbhavam, agataha, they agataha, they have reached madbhavam, my state. What is, you've seen these expressions before, and, they, and at first they seem very mystical, and, and abstract and very lofty. What does it mean to reach the state of Ishvara? Well, here you can see very clearly what it means to reach the state of Ishvara. It is to realize that the reality because of which Ishvara exists, tat, is not different than the reality because of which you exist, twam the recognition that, that the truth of you is identical to the truth of Ishra, Tatvamasi. That recognition is what it means to reach Ishvara's state, Madhavam, or to become Manmaya, to become uh, absorbed in Ishra, to become non-separate from Ishra. It's a matter of immediate recognition. The commentator uses the term sakshat kara, kara, to, to make sakshat, to make immediate and direct. It is then an immediate personal, immediate means unmediated, there's nothing in between. It is direct, it is simple, and it is clear that recognition that the truth of who you are and the truth of Ishvara are not two different truths. They're not two different realities. One and the same reality. That's the revelation of the Mahavakya, Tat Tvam Asi. Okay. Now, we'll see two more verses. I'd like to end with this verse. So in order to end with this verse, with your permission, I'm going to take the next two verses out of order. Generally, we don't do that, but here it'll be helpful, just helpful from the standpoint of a teacher. Uh, a teacher who just wants to make things as clear as possible. Generally, we do want to, certainly we want to recite these verses in order, but for the sake of ending our, my discourse today with this verse, for that reason, we're going to see this uh, verse 12 first, and then we'll back up one verse. Kang shanta karma, Kang shanta karma nam siddhim, Kang shanta, Kang shanta karma nam siddhim, Yajanta hiha devataha, Yajanta hiha devataha, Kshipram hi manushe loke, Kshipram hi manushe loke, Siddhir bhavati karma ja, Siddhir bhavati karma ja. Okay, so the prior verse we just saw talked about those who become purified through knowledge and reach Ishvara. Many, you know, Sri Krishna says they are many in number, but many is a relative <laughs> term. <laughs> if there are a thousand people who are seeking the truth of Ishvara, that's many. 
but compared to the millions and billions of people who live on this planet, it's relatively few in number. And the fact is the vast majority of people are not seeking the truth of Ishvara. They're seeking based on Raga Dvesha. They're seeking to get what makes them feel good. They're seeking to avoid what makes them feel bad. And they can seek, seek that with the help of religion, with the help of prayer, with the help of worship even. That's what Sri Krishna says here. Kangshantaha karmanam siddhim. Kangshantaha. Those who are desiring. Desiring what? Siddhim. Accomplishment. Aco what kind of accomplishment? Karmanam. Accomplishment of their actions. Those who are seeking Siddhikan means success. Those people who are seeking success in life by means of karma, by means of action, by means of effort. And success in life means getting what you want. Success in, this is the conventional definition of success, is getting what you want and avoiding what you don't want. There are many who are seeking in life, kangshantaha, they are seeking in life, karmanam siddhim, they are seeking success in life through their efforts. Now their efforts in life include not merely going to work, especially in ancient times, um, a lot of focus in ancient times was on rituals especially Vedic rituals, these yajnas, complicated yajnas. And that's what Sri Krishna says here. Iha, in the second line, here in this world, yajante, they worship. Who do they worship? Devataha. They worship all the different gods, all the different deities. They're worshiping for the sake of worldly success. We've had this discussion before. And that is, prayer and worship can and are frequently used for very materialistic reasons. We call this, what did we call it? We call this uh, spiritual materialism. We called this once long ago. Spiritual materialism means to recognize that prayer and worship is one more means of accomplishing your goals, gaining success, one more way of, of, of invoking God's grace to get what you want and avoid what you don't want. So, by the way, just uh, I, I think of this as a cultural translation. A cultural translation means to take a teaching and transform it from an ancient worldview to a modern worldview. I call that cultural translation. So in the ancient worldview, these devatas were powers of nature, personified as deities, right? So, so uh, Indra was a power of nature personified as Indra, perhaps a power of thunder and lightning and rains. Uh, Varuna, uh, god of waters. Vayu, god of the winds. Agni, god of fire. All of these gods represented powers of nature. In modern times, we understand powers of nature very well, <laughs> scientifically. So we could reinterpret this then, as and that is, in modern times, those who are desiring success through worldly efforts, what do they do? They don't worship the deities, they employ principles of science. And this is like a, we'll call this a parallel concept. Whereas in ancient times, they were worshiping these deities, which were forms of, of nature. And in modern times, we are manipulating the laws of science, the laws of nature through our scientific understanding, but both in both cases for the same goal, and the goal is worldly success, to get what you want and avoid uh, what you don't want. And there's nothing wrong in that. Look at then the next half of the verse, you see something very important. Sri Krishna does not criticize this. 
What's wrong with seeking happiness in life? What's wrong with avoiding tragedies in life? There's nothing wrong with it. It's just limited. Limited effort, limited results. Correct? Limited effort, limited results. Problem is, what we seek, what we really want, is limitless, unending happiness and contentment. And you won't get limitless, unending happiness and contentment through limitless, limited efforts. We've discussed that before. But here Sri Krishna doesn't condemn this worldly seeking. He, s he says in the third line, he indeed, loke, in manushe loke, in this world of men, in this world in which we live, he indeed, chipram, quickly, siddhi bhavati, quickly siddhi, success bhavati, arises, quickly success arises, karma ja, and we can take karma in two, two means. One is karma in the sense of rituals, the other is karma in the sense of worldly efforts, using the, the uh, scientific knowledge. In either case, through rituals or through worldly efforts, employing the scientific knowledge, you gain success. Siddhi bhaviti. You gain worldly success quickly. And this is how he, he doesn't criticize it, but rather he praises it. So he says, there's nothing wrong with seeking worldly happiness. There's nothing wrong with seeking to avoid worldly sadness. The problem is, if that's all you seek, you're missing something. You're missing a lot. And that's what he'll... That, that's what we've seen in the prior verses. Let's see how he concludes this, this uh, line of thought. Oh, we want to back up now. Here we go. And we'll end with this verse. And notice I backed up from verse 12 to verse 11. Ye yata mam prapadyante, ye yata mam prapadyante, tansta taiva bhajam yaham, tansta taiva bhajam yaham, mama vartmanu vartante, mama vartmanu vartante, manushya parta sarvashaha, manushya parta sarvashaha. Yea, those people, yata, in whatever manner, prapadyante, in whatever way they seek, mom, me. Now here, we're shifting gears. So the prior verse was those seeking worldly success, and that's being contrasted by those who seek Mom, Sri Krishna says, those who seek me. There are those people who seek worldly su success, worldly success divine, defined as getting what you want, avoiding what you don't want. But now we're talking about, yea, those who, mam prapadyante, those who seek me. Yata, in whatever manner they seek me, in the second line, tata eva. We have to break those words apart. So in whatever way they seek me, tata eva, in that same way, bhajami aham, aham I bhajami. Now bhaj, the root bhaj has many meanings, and uh, not always worship. In fact, bhaj is a root, actually means to divide, to separate, or even to cut. Here, uh, uh, aham bhajami, I don't worship, but I, I bless, tan, the first word. I bless them. Let me paraphrase that first half. In whatever way people seek me, people different from the people we just saw, the people seeking worldly success, setting those people aside, now we're talking about people who seek me, Sri Krishna says, and in whatever way they seek me, tata eva, in that manner, 
Tan bhajami aham, I bless them. Now, we, it'd be helpful for a little bit more specific. So, seeking Ishvara in what way? Well, in the last chapter we studied karma yoga. So, karma yoga is practiced as to propel one on that path of spiritual growth. Path of spiritual growth is a path of seeking Ishvara, certainly. So, those who seek me, Mam prapadyante means those who are on a path of spiritual growth and maybe on a path of spiritual growth perhaps are practicing karma yoga. So those who employ karma yoga to seek Ishvara, Sri Krishna says, I bless them accordingly. And the message here is if you practice karma yoga, you are blessed accordingly and that is Karma yoga frees you from raga dvesha. So if you are practicing karma yoga on the path of spiritual growth, Sri Krishna blesses you by freeing you gradually from raga dvesha. Or suppose you, you, you practice bhakti, devotion. Suppose you're a, a deeply devotional person and your devotion is focused on Sri Krishna, then accordingly, if that devotion is the focal point of your spiritual practice, in the second line, Sri Krishna says, I will bless you accordingly, tata eva. And blessing you accordingly means you'll be blessed with intimacy. You'll be blessed with inner peace. You'll be blessed with this sense of, of closeness, intimacy with Ishvara. Or suppose you practice dhyana, meditation. So if you are practicing dhyana, meditation on your path of spiritual growth, Sri Krishna says, I will bless you accordingly. And how is that? You're blessed if you're practicing meditation, you're blessed with samadhi, you're blessed with absorption, you're blessed with the peaceful silence. When your mind becomes quiet, in this way Sri Krishna blesses you. Now to, to, to return to our context here, suppose you are pursuing Sri Krishna by, 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 by gaining knowledge. What knowledge? This knowledge. Suppose you are trying, you are seeking Ishvara by, per, by pursuing knowledge. You're seeking Ishvara by pursuing this particular knowledge. And in that way, Sri Krishna blesses you accordingly. And to be blessed accordingly means to be blessed with recognition. Specifically, to be blessed with the recognition that Brahman or Tat, the reality because of which Ishvara exists, and Atma or Twam, the reality because of which you exist as an individual, to the recognition of the identity of the truth of Ishvara is identical to the truth of you. That recognition is that which, with which you are blessed if you seek Ishvara through pursuing knowledge. And Sri Krishna concludes in the third line, Partha, O Arjuna, Sarvashaha, in all different manners, Manushyaha, people going up, and Anuvartante, people follow. People follow Anuvartante, they follow Sarvashaha in all ways, Mama Vartma, my path. People follow my path, Mama Vartma. People follow my path in all ways. What does that mean? To, we just gave four examples. You can seek seeking Ishvara through Karma Yoga, removing Raga Dvesha, seeking Ishvara through Bhakti, uh, gaining the sense of intimacy, seeking Ishvara through Dhyana, gaining this absorption, and finally, seeking Ishvara through jnanam, through knowledge, through recognition. In all these ways, people seek. And ultimately, 
All of these people are blessed. Sri Krishna says, Bhajami Aham. I bless all of them in accordance with their efforts. Whatever efforts they are making to seek me, Sri Krishna says, according to their efforts, I bless them. Okay, we'll conclude here. Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramayaha Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Ma Kaschadukha Bhagbaveta Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityor Ma Amritangamaya Om Shanti 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 Om Tat Sat. <laughs>